Want to know how elite tax advisors win the due diligence game to satisfy ultra high net worth clients who expect the very best? Welcome to the Due Diligence Project Podcast, where you get a chance to learn from the elite CPAs, virtual family office professionals and tax specialists who are doing just that. We'll uncover their insider secrets on how they are dominating their competition, vetting new ideas and supercharging their due diligence process to deliver extraordinary results. Bringing his 25 plus years of experience with top tax professionals across the country, please welcome your host, Alex Sunkin. Good day and welcome to the Due Diligence Project podcast. Today's guest is Brian Kerrigan. He's an elite virtual family office professional, elite CPA with a tax focus serving ultra high net worth business owners. He's also a specialist as part of the Due Diligence Project virtual family office hub. So thank you so much, Brian, for for joining us. How are you today? I'm great, Alex. Thanks for having me. It is my pleasure. So I know we're still in the middle of this uh, COVID-19 situation. Um, how are you hanging in there? And tell us what's, what's going on out there on the, on the East Coast. Yeah, we're hanging in there fine. I think, you know, we, we had to make a transition from being obviously an in-office firm to a virtual firm, and, uh, which, which, which the VFO Hub has done for years, but it was different for an accounting firm. Uh, but this, it's been a unique time to be a CPA working with business clients because, you know, for the first time in a long time, they're worried about survival right now. And they're worried about how they adapt to a new market. And hopefully at some point they'll thrive again. But, you know, the expectation is that, you know, there's some clients that we're going to work with who are in a good position because they can go out and they can buy assets, you know, buy other companies at, at cheaper multiples. They can borrow at lower interest rates. So some of our clients are going to have great opportunities through all this. And I think one of my keys is to remind them that there are opportunities in a crisis. Absolutely. And that's one of the things we love about you. You're not only an elite virtual family office elite CPA with a tax focus, but you're also an amazing specialist part of our hub. And we're going to talk about what you're doing in terms of providing proactive advice to these business owners who are, you know, I'm telling you, some of these business owners are one, two ideas away from literally doubling or tripling their revenue. And it's really important to have access to a mastermind group, to a think tank that has a lot of experience and just a big wide viewpoint. And that's really something you bring to the virtual family office hub. Before we get jump into that, because I want to talk about that. I want to talk about how you do due diligence sure. personally. But before we jump into all that stuff and really just expose your wisdom to our audience, how did you get started in this business? And, and why did you choose this business? Let's, let's talk about it. It's actually a funny story. I went, I, I went, I, I took my accounting major because I wanted to go in the FBI. Wow. And yeah, it was, and, and, and then I realized that if I went in the FBI, they could send me wherever they wanted to send me and I'd have no choice in the matter. And then I decided, well, maybe I don't want to do that. This might be a more interesting podcast if you had joined the FBI. I'm just going to preface it right now. And not, not, not but um, wow. So we have a, what, what a combination of skill sets. Someone wants to join the FBI and now you're a VFO CPA. Um, tell me more about that. So why did you yeah. not, why did you choose this and not the FBI? Well, it's funny. I, that's the reason I chose, I chose I didn't go with the FBI because I didn't want to really get moved around the country. And they tend to move you out of your home area because they don't want you known to the, you know, to the, the people who are who you're trying to chase down. Um, so I didn't do it. And I ended up, um, I had a buddy who got me into Ernst & Young. And, you know, I had, I, I really had no idea what it was going to mean to be an accountant. My my dad worked in a warehouse. My mom had a daycare. I had no idea really how the business world worked. And I had, I just really had to figure it out on the fly. And I think one thing I'm thankful for is, you know, being the first in my family to go through school and go through law school. Um, you know, I'm hoping that I can sort of pass on to my kids some of this business knowledge that I've acquired. So they sort of start with you know, a little bit of an advantage over what I had. Brian, you know, when you, I didn't know this whole FBI thing about you. It's, it's, it's crazy. I'm just, I'm blown away by it. But what's interesting about that is, you know, 
one of the key components, one of the key principles of our due diligence process is really forensic analysis, not yeah. only of the speaker, the presenter and the specialist, but also the, their testimony. We look at the testimony of the response of our attorneys and family offices and elite CPAs as they mm -hmm. listen to the, to the specialists and give us feedback. And we analyze their forensic, you know, forensically, we analyze their feedback to just figure out, you know, do, are, do they have an ax to grind? Is there a reason why they mm -hmm. don't like it? So talk to me about how you do due diligence. And because really it's interesting is going into the FBI or, or doing what you do in terms of doing due diligence is that forensic analysis of due diligence seems to be very similar. Tell me about how you do due diligence and, and share that with us. Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest way to explain it, I think, was when I first started working with you guys and I was looking at the charitable LLC. And really, my first instinct was, you know, wow, this, you know, this seems great. Let me, tr let me try to find the hole in it, you know, because, you know, that's part of the due diligence process. Let's kind of, let's put the strategy out there. Let's expose it to, you know, a number of, you know, a large number of people and see if there's any gaps in the analysis. And, you know, and, and most CPAs are pretty risk averse, so they don't want to be proposing risky strategies to their clients. And I remember just immersing myself in the information that you had given to me, but then also, you know, joining you on calls to ask you questions. And you actually put me in touch with some of the attorneys who draft the charitable LLC structure, you know, and they were able to answer my questions. And I looked at it for probably a month, a month and a half, and I, I couldn't see a hole in it. And I, you know, and I thought it was going to be something that was extremely beneficial to my clients. But that's the way I do it. I kind of, the, the law school background in me makes me feel like I can teach myself anything. So if I have the right materials, I can immerse myself in it. And if there's a hole, I'll find it. Well, you know, what's interesting is there's another, there's another pillar that we look at for extraordinary revolutionary due diligence, and, and that's curiosity. Um, and it's funny when we meet elite CPAs or family office leaders, and they're no longer curious because they already know everything. Mm -hmm. Wow. That, to us, I'm like, that's danger. You know, you have, a, you have clients back there who are in a very dangerous situation. And one of the things we, yeah. we, we loved about you when we met you, former Ernst & Young, all these things, you're still curious. You're still learning. So even with all this, I mean, how long have you been doing this, Brian? Uh, like 22 years at this point. You, you would think you do this for 22 years. You've got this thing figured out. But, you know, so you're, you're meeting these people. You're meeting us. You're meeting our resources, going through the process. And, and that combination of your curiosity and your tenacity to actually complete the job because due diligence takes a while. Now, of course, we facilitate that process for you, but you got to do the work. You got to get on the calls, you know, so. We do. And then when we're, and even when we're done with your due diligence, it's not done because now it's time to present this to your ultra high net worth clients. And what right. does that mean? We have third party advisors, third party attorneys, third, they want to jump in. And what are they going to do? they're going to do their own due diligence, right. which, which either blows up, which either points out a weakness or mm -hmm. it, it strengthens our conviction. And yeah. that's the due diligence. Part. So I, I'm just, I'm just happy that, you know, to have people like you as part of the VFO hub due diligence project, it gives me confidence and it gives the rest of our community confidence to have curious tenacious people who are very, very serious about making sure that they have access to everything for their best clients. So let, let's talk about what you bring to the table besides accessing our knowledge base. Let's okay. flip it. You've given us some tremendous ideas and talk to us about the innovative approach that you have for being proactive and bringing ideas to your business owner clients beyond mm -hmm. You know, yesterday I got on the phone with this guy who, you know, was like, I'm a technician. I build an amazing tax return. I didn't want to break it to him that tax returns don't have a lot of value in the world right now. So I didn't tell him that. But um, I made him actually feel really good. But you're, you, you've you known that the tax return is not, not worth anything. You're bringing massive value to your clients. Talk to us about that. 
Yeah, so really what we're doing is we're really, you know, it's a forward advising model. Historically, CPA firms have kind of looked backward and they've recorded history. They really haven't had the ability to look forward and help clients develop strategy. I mean, one of the one of the things that I do every day religiously is I read the Wall Street Journal. And the reason I do that is because I want to understand the economic trends that are going on in the world so that I can communicate to my clients what the next six months is going to look like, what the next nine months, what the next year is going to look like. And, you know, we, we want to be a resource that helps them create value in their business. So when I typically start working with a client, the goal is to over a seven to 10 year period, have 10 to 15% growth and double the value of the business. Because as you know, most, most business owners want to either sell to fund their retirement at some point, or they want to leave a legacy, a valuable legacy to their loved ones. So, you know, if you can actually create value in a business enterprise, if you can help develop the strategy that creates that value, you, you become an invaluable resource for your clients. And there's not a lot of people who do it. I mean, right now, if, if, if you're talking, if, if our audience represents other CPA firms talking to their business owner clients, and, and we can kind of move them in, those business owners are in a number of different brackets right now. Some are making more money than they've ever made in their lives. Yeah. They got the PPP loan, which is not deductible anymore. They're going to have a humongous tax problem at the end of the year. That's one group yeah. of clients. Then you have another group of clients who are still surviving, but their business is potentially at risk and the future looks we don't know what it looks like. And you have another group, their business is gone and they're hoping and waiting. And what do we, you know, for, if you look at these three different types of segments in, of business owners, what advice do you have for them? And what questions do you have for them? And, and let, let's talk about that real world situation right now. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's start with the first group. I mean, the last group that you talked about, I think it's sort of the easiest is, you know, Business is gone. I mean, the, the reality is I live in a small town in Connecticut. We probably have 12 to 15 restaurants. We're only going to have three or four restaurants after this is done. I mean, there, there's no sense putting good money to chase bad. I mean, at some point, you have to know whether, whether you're going to be able to survive as a business and earn a rate of return that's commensurate with the amount of risk you're willing to take. So I think, you know, with some of our clients, it's really just advising them, you know, that it may be time to do something else and don't continue to invest in something where demand is not going to come back for a year, for 18 months, you know, unless you're well healed and you have the ability to do that. You know, maybe maybe it's time to think about doing something else that's you know maybe a little more uh, more essential. And not that restaurants aren't essential, but the reality is, you know, I don't know the next time restaurants are going to be full. I think it's I think it's a great point. I think it's very very dangerous to assume anything. You know, to assume that we're going to go back to no, to the old pre COVID nineteen normal is, I think, an idea um, to bank. To, to put a lot into that idea is, is risky. Um, okay. and we don't know what it, you know, I, we always work with what's working right now. Mm -hmm. What's working right now? What think, what would, what do you think is going to be working in the future? And let's take our emotions out of it. And that's what I would tell these, and that's really hard. That's a hard conversation. It is. So and they've spent years building that business. I mean, they don't they don't want to hear that demand's not going to come back for the next 12 to 18 months. And, yeah. You know, the reality is most restaurants operate on a very tight margin as it is. And you, right. you know, they don't have a lot of room for demand to fall off the way it's going to fall off. And if you're talking about what I'm hearing is that restaurants are going to be at 25 to 50 percent. See, because of social distancing. And, and, you know, and I, you know, my and I, I'm. I'm blessed that I don't have to have these conversations. You know, I have, I have friends that I have conversations with, but my, our community is elite CPAs and family offices and specialists. And you're the ones that have to have most of these conversations with business owners. But you know, the, 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 the thing, the thing that they have to remember that that lower group is look, when you made the investment, when you put the time and blood and sweat and tears and money into this deal, we were in a completely different framework. 
We were, yeah. we were, we were, you built it on a landscape that no longer exists. Mm. And if, and now if you were to make that same investment, you would maybe not do it. Right. Right. So get the emotion out of it and look at what you have right now, what's working, what's not working and just get that hustle back in your mind because this is a, this is the hustler time. Yeah. This reset. That's what I would say. So let's now let's look at that middle group. Um, yeah, the middle group. I kind of look at that like my construction clients. So okay. things are things are okay now. They've got they've got projects that they're working on. Um, but you know the reality is that if they don't sort of pivot and adapt now, they may they may end up out of business. So when you look at the economic trends, I mean, it, it, you know, there's not going to be a lot of commercial office space built. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of retail space built. If, if anything, both of those, are, there's going to be vacancy problems in both of those situations. You know, if Twitter, if Twitter tells their, their, their employees, they don't ever have to go back to the office again until they're comfortable. I mean, you start telling millennials, they don't have to go to work. They could just work from the comfort of their own home. And definitely yeah. they're going to choose that. So, you know, this is a crazy time obviously commercial real estate, all these different places. But if you're in that middle group, what are we doing? Are we, we're banking money, saving money. Let's do some tax elimination. Let's do some cost elimination. Let's create this cushion Mm -hmm. and, and look and think and plan and let's get, maybe that's the group. And maybe those two bottom groups need to have some serious planning meetings with some mastermind, outsourced brains that are not emotionally connected to those businesses that can basically provide maybe one or two ideas and say, what's going on in your local area or regional area? What are some of these opportunities? What are you seeing? Because I think right now is a very, very important time to make sure you have an elite virtual family office professional that has the very, very best peer reviewed resources on the planet where maybe all it takes is one or two ideas, Brian. Yeah, take the situation. Yeah, I think our construction, our commercial construction companies are going to have to move to lower margin municipal work, and you know even that comes with some risk because obviously with the states bleeding money at this point and looking to the federal government to inject some stimulus into them, you know I don't I don't feel real good about the construction industry over the next five years. And I think you really have to make sure that you've taken all of the waste and excess costs out of your business. And, um, you know, hopefully you're able, there's enough demand where you're able to make sort of a reduced living, but I don't think it's going to be what it used to be. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Let's, let's, let's talk about the top group. I mean, uh, it's nice to be in that yeah. top group. Um, you know, I want to say that that top group had better due diligence than the other two groups, but I can't say that, you know, I I can't say that maybe they got lucky. Maybe they did something happened, but they're in this top group. They they're producing something that the world, you know, the governments say is essential. People are Mm -hmm. buying it. The markets, you know, everything's working for them. Maybe they got the PPP loan. Maybe they didn't get the PPP loan. What do we say to this group, Brian? This group is really about how do you strategize around growth. So one of the things that we do with the PPP loan is that effectively gives you the ability to not have payroll and rent and utilities for an eight-week period. That money can be plowed into growth strategies. So that's money you would have spent on payroll that you can put towards growth. And, you know, we really want, uh, I have a, to give you an example, I have a manufacturer of EMT equipment. And one of the things that I told them early on is you're going to have to develop a sales team. They, they're, they're lucky in that there's demand for their product and the phone tends to ring, but they've never had a concentrated sales process. Mm-hmm. And they're going to need that if they want to get to the $10 million exit level that they want. So I think we're using the PPP money at this point to fund payroll, but as a backdoor way of funding the sales department that they need. You know, the reality is they were 
they were all they were always having cash flow issues and the PPP was a huge break for them because it basically gave them some liquidity and now they can invest in their growth and that that's what those top tier companies should be doing is in, you know reinvesting their profits now in growth buying those companies at cheaper multiples buying that piece of equipment at a lower interest rate that's going to make you more efficient you know looking at these you know they they have the luxury of kind of taking this time they have business at this point and they can look for growth opportunities i i mean that's a great point i think for all three groups i think it's really really important to just keep your eyes and ears open and test and test and test you know we've seen we see we saw a huge surge in the last couple months just of panic buying right we don't want to create a, a, a plan based on the panic buying of March, right, uh, in right. early April to say this is what it's going to look like in the future because that may have just been a very, very short-term event. Um, right. So it, it's really, really tricky because we don't really know where we're going to land. We just have to, you know, for, as a former floor trader and someone who has tremendous respect for risk, this is the time to be looking to test, to make, you know, stick your maybe toe in the water just a little bit to see what's going on, just to see where this is going, because we are moving very, very quickly in a direction. And we don't have time to figure out where we're going to land before we make decisions. So we have a moving target mm -hmm. and we have a lot of competition to find this moving target. So right now I think is a critical time to have a team of resources and brain power and experience to help make those decisions because I think every decision right now, the the you know the ROI could be off the charts or it could be really, really bad depending on what decision is made. I mean what how important is your role right now to these business owners in terms of what's gonna happen to their livelihoods, their families over the next five, mm. ten years? Well, it's funny. I was on a call last night with a with a with a medical practice, and one of the first things they said to me is sort of my advice and guidance during this crisis has been invaluable. I mean, they you know they needed leadership, and you know it's a seven doctor practice. They really um, they they were kind of they had their heads down for a little bit, and they and they really needed sort of uh, you know someone to provide some leadership and help them help them realize that given what they do, that this is a temporary glitch and that, that things, we know that we know that people are going to need retina surgeries in the future. Um, but they, they really needed, and that's one of the things you and I talked about early on, yeah. is that pe company business owners really need leadership at this point. If you're being afraid to stick your neck out there and give some advice is, is not a good place right now. Well, look, you the reason you know, you being a former EY, you know, top, top, top specialist out there, also a top generalist in terms of being a lead CPA family office guy. I mean, the reason you joined us is not because we have a bunch of salespeople in our organization. We don't want salespeople. You know, we right. want thought leaders. Okay. And unless someone is, a, is, if you're not a thought leader, unless you're an A or A plus specialist, A, A plus level tax attorney, you're not going to be part of our community. And people like you are going to just find the weaknesses and point them out and, th and they're gone. That's kind of how it works. That's what essentially Amazon peer review does. Netflix, hey, look, you know, I'm on Netflix and if I see a movie and it's got one star and there's a bunch of other movies that have five stars, I'm gonna watch the five star movie or I can go to Blockbuster and just sit there for hours looking at every cover, one cover after another cover, reading the back and going, I wonder if this movie's good. Hey, did you guys see this movie? Uh, anyone in Blockbuster see this movie? Is this any good? Or I can go to Netflix and get 5,000 people telling me, oh, that's got 4.5 stars. Hmm. You know, right now, these business owners, they don't need salespeople. They need thought leadership. They need people with experience who are connected to a platform with other elite thought leaders who have a lot of experience and maybe get on a, on a call or a Zoom like this for 15, 20, 30 minutes, listen mm -hmm. to that business owner, understand that situation, and maybe provide two or three ideas. And maybe in that 30 minute conversation, I mean, this is what, if, if I was in a business that had this situation, if I was in group two or three, or even in group one, this is what we're talking about. Now, the good news is we're already in that. 
we're yeah. surrounded by these masterminds. That's what we have in the VFO and the DDP. But the ability to access this knowledge base and bring this knowledge to your clients, how does that make you feel at the end of the day, knowing the kind of value you're providing? I, I really love my job. Like it's not, it's not hard to get up in the morning and, and sit down and do it. I mean, I know that I'm going to be able to create some level of value with some subset of clients on a, on a daily basis. And I enjoy it. I mean, I, I've always enjoyed the business strategy side of things more than the tax and accounting side of it. Do I still do a lot of tax? Yeah. I mean, I do, I work with Alex and I do tax planning for high net worth individuals, but, but I don't, and business owners, but, but I, you, I don't do compliance work. Well, here's the thing. I mean, that, that compliance work is not valuable to the business owner because most no. of these business owners, if you think about the average business owner, right, that, that successful mm -hmm. business owners out there, they're not all strategists. Okay. They are. And we, you know, you work with them. I work with them. We, a lot of these extremely successful business owners are specialists or they're amazing managers. They're managing 300 people and they're not the visionary. They're not the person that's saying, okay, here's the risk. I'm going to avoid risk. They're managing this incredibly successful business or they invented something or they're a specialist inside that business where they're the best at what they do. And they're not that strategy. So they need this mastermind team around them, what if they couldn't hire those people? What if they just hired a bunch of other specialists that are just really, really good at their jobs and they're just running this thing and now they've hit this wall? What are they going to do? How do they find these consultants to help them navigate through this? So look, we do a lot here in the VFO Hub. I mean, we built this thing on tax elimination because the tax code is, no one knows how big it is. Tax returns are all to solicit or market their new tax planning strategy. So we need to bridge the gap between all these CPAs and family offices and all these resources out there. But now we realize that those resources, maybe tax planning is not the most important thing. Maybe risk is becoming more important. Liquidity, um, repositioning your business, reinventing your business. We need ideas. Yep. And you can't just go to a salesperson and extract ideas from them. We need thought leadership and we need a community. So we're really, really happy to have someone with your background and your expertise part of our community because you know what we do sometimes. I'll, I've, I've invited you into our you know, octagon ring where we've invited you, we've invited attorneys, and we've invited brand new specialists with brand new exciting ideas. And I'm like, listen, Brian. We're going to put them in the ring. They're going to share mm -hmm. their thing. We're going to beat them up a little bit. Don't beat them up too hard, but I want to see the fight, right? right. We want to see attorneys, CPA, specialists, resources, all in a group, maybe four or five, six professionals. Mm. And we want to see the fight because we want to do a forensic analysis on the attorney's response to that specialist, that yep. specialist testimony, your feedback. And then what do we do? We get one-on-one -on -one with you, with all these people and extract the feedback Mm -hmm. share the feedback, put, stir the pot up and go, is this good? And what do we do, Brian? We figure out, okay, first of all, is this strategy going to create tax court risk, audit risk? Okay. It's not. So that's good. Can we explain it to the client where the client's going to understand it? If we can't explain it to a client in a simple way, it goes out, right? Uh, so this is what we're doing because there's a lot of stuff that we can bring to clients, but it's got to be simple. It's got to be clean. It can't be risky. And so a lot of the stuff gets thrown out, um, but we are really, really grateful to have people like you because without your background and experience, it would be very difficult for us to sift through all this information. So thank you. Thank you for being part. Before we, end, can you tell us something besides the FBI thing um, okay. that's interesting about you that maybe your clients don't know? Well, I think you you know how big of a Tom Brady fan I am. We we both we both share that. I actually grew up in Foxborough, Massachusetts, in the the eighties and nineties, and I was in that stadium when the Patriots were one in fifteen, and Rod Rust was coaching the team, and they had scandals and they had changes in ownership and. I was I was a kid and I was there and I loved it. My mother my mother actually watched some of the Patriots players' kids, mm. so 
I actually got free tickets to to every game. And uh, one game, I was I was eight years old, and I was complaining to my father about the offensive coordinator's play calling. And I guess I was sitting next to the offensive coordinator's wife. Oh my God, that's all. now that that's a great story. So look, look, I didn't want to push you into this whole Tom Brady conversation, and I didn't know that's where you were going to go. But I'm really happy that you did because you know Tom Brady is uh, is one of my guys. Um, yeah, and uh, I I just love his competition. You know, I was I was they were they were showing an old clip of him, and someone asked him, you know, who's your who's your hero? And of course, Tom Brady goes into his like little boyish thing, and he's like, my hero. That's a great question. I guess my hero is my my dad. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you could see him tearing up. He's like, yeah, my dad. Yeah. And I'm watching this thing and I'm like, oh, oh, my God, a little dusty in here. You know, and he just brings me, um, when I think of Tom Brady, I just think of, man, he is the American dream. Um, just a good kid, worked hard. My story about Tom Brady is a good kid, worked hard, uh, got, a, got a good haircut, uh, you know, got good at football, married a supermodel, you know, but – I love that too. And, um, but I think that's one thing that we share is we both, we're both very competitive, you know, in what we do and we enjoy seeing other people being very competitive. I mean, I was, I was, I'm a Celtics fan. So I sort of had mixed feelings about Kobe Bryant, but you could, but you, you want to talk about a guy who had a will to win. I mean, Kobe Bryant was, you know, probably right up there with Michael Jordan in terms of drive to win. You know, when you when people compete um, and compete and, and put themselves out there and position themselves where there's that risk of loss and they lose and they come back with class and they compete and work hard, you know, unless you compete, you, you don't understand. But but competitors, when you see that, you have to respect even the ones that hurt you. You know, for me, you know, I'm a Michigan guy and, you know, I can say a lot of bad things about Ohio State and Urban Meyer, mm-hmm. but I respect Ohio State. I respect Urban Meyer, whether they're questionable tactics, whether there's cheating going on, you know, there it takes a, even to cheat and win like that takes a lot of work. You know, um, I don't respect cheaters, but I respect the focus that Urban Meyer and Ohio State have on beating Michigan. I mean, you can't say they're not focused. And so competition, Tom Brady, all these people putting themselves out there you know, I coach a little bit of flag football. I coach my boys in soccer and basketball, and I've done a lot of coaching. It's one of the greatest things I've ever done is coach my sons, and I've had a chance to coach some of the best athletes here in, in San Diego County, and I've coached against Drew Brees in flag football and all this, these amazing experiences. And every time I lose, I don't want to coach again. I'm like, I don't want, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to. Now, of course, I get back out there. And so I know what Tom Brady goes through when he loses. Every kind of these, every time a competitor like that loses, they're like, I said, I'm done. I'm done. I don't want to lose anymore. Michael Jordan too. And then of course it comes back and you get back on that horse. You go back to mm-hmm. work and you put yourself out in that playing field and you put yourself at risk of loss again. To me, that competition is, that's what, you know, that that's awesome because it's scary. Well, that's, to me, that's where you get growth in your life. If you're not, if you're not out taking chances and taking risk and trying, you know, trying to win the day, I mean, you're not, you're not, you're not fully developing yourself. I mean, you know, it's easy, you know, to sit back and say, all right, I'm comfortable doing what I do, but there's no growth there. Hey, so we, we, strive for growth. we look for that. We look for curiosity. We look for an incredible experience and background and, but we look for competition. We look for competitors and, uh, and, and we love that in you and the rest of our communities built of, 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 of competitors. And the nice thing about it, the awesome thing about it is even though you and I compete, we don't win unless our clients win. And in, our, in my situation, our clients are people like you. And in your situation, it's these, these business owners that are out there competing in their marketplaces. And so, you know, we love working with elite CPAs and virtual family offices because you know, the ones that we find, the 0.0001%, the top 0.001% of that family office CPA universe, we are blessed to have them as part of the VFO Hub and Due Diligence Project. But when we compete, we're not competing for ourselves, we're competing for our clients and our our interests are aligned with our clients. And that's so important 
Um, Because a lot of professionals can't say that. You know, when I was a former trader, okay, when I was a floor trader in Chicago, I remember the Board of Trade, the Merck, and the CBO. When I competed, someone was on the losing end of that trade. Or if I took the loss, someone was on the positive end of that trade. My interests were not aligned, you know, with the players. It was like a boxing match. Someone gets knocked out, someone wins. There was someone, something eating away at me when I was doing that. And so it just brings me so much more joy when we can win for, for our clients. And I think it does the same thing for you. Anyway, listen, this has been a great, uh, it's been great diving into your mind. I think our audience got a chance to see a little bit about your due diligence process, what you bring to the table, what you bring to your clients, what you bring the VFO hub and due diligence project. Um, any parting words, words for our audience? No, I mean, I, th- I think I think I'd want to end just sort of on that growth on that growth concept. I mean, you know, most of the people that we associate with through the VFO hub are willing to sort of get outside their comfort zone and look at something new. And I think that's really, to me, that's the key to growth. And those are the t- type of people that we want in the VFO hub. Hey, listen, and I, we're very very blessed to have you as part of that VFO hub. Uh, part of our VFO hub and we really appreciate your contributions. We look forward to a even long, a long term relationship with you and we're just getting started, Brian. So listen, have a great day. Um, Have a great weekend. And uh, I guess we're going to be rooting for, for both for Tom Brady and and, in Tampa Bay and also Mm -hmm. um, your new England Patriots um, as a result of that Tom Brady tenure there. But listen, thank you so much for your, for your time. Thank you for contributing to the Due Diligence Project podcast. Um, and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much, all Brian. Right, thank, thanks for having me, Alex. Okay. That's all for this episode of the Due Diligence Project podcast. Be sure to visit diligenceproject.com to access the resources we have available for qualified CPAs and family office leaders. Our mission at the Due Diligence Project is to help you deliver more significance and value to your very best clients while shifting your traditional practice into the firm of the future. 